One, two, one, two, three, four. Hey everybody, it's Sam Jacobs. Welcome to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Welcome back. Uh, It's really exciting to be in the heart of 2019. We've got a bunch of incredible guests that are lined up for the year. And we've got today on the show, Amy Appleyard, the SVP of Global Inside Sales for Carbon Black. Amy is somebody that graduated from undergrad with a theater degree. She's an entrepreneur. She started a bunch of her own businesses in the theater industry, then went to business school, had a family, joined Staples Advanced manage in the finance team and ultimately found her way to the sales organization where she ended up running very large teams and doing incredibly well. And she's she's got a great mix of analytical and strategic skills coupled with people skills. And she really cares about the teams and the people that she works with. She really sounds like a great leader and it was a real delight to interview her. And she's sort of a rising star in the Boston technology scene and the Boston sales leadership scene. So I'm really excited about the interview. Now, before we get to the interview, we've got some sponsors. We've actually got a brand new sponsor. So the first is Chorus.ai. Chorus is the leading conversation intelligence platform for high growth sales teams. They record, transcribe, and analyze business conversations in real time to coach reps on how to become top performers. With Chorus.ai, more reps meet quota, new hires ramp faster, leaders become better coaches, and everyone in the organization can collaborate over the actual voice of the customer. Check out Chorus.ai forward slash sales hacker to see what they're up to. Our second sponsor is our friendly neighborhood Outreach.io, the leading sales engagement platform. Outreach supports sales reps by enabling them to humanize their communications at scale from automating the soul sucking manual work that eats up selling time. All of that soul suck. Don't get your soul sucked, folks, to providing action oriented tips on what communications are working best. Outreach has your back. So hop over to outreach.io forward slash sales hacker to see how thousands of customers, including Carbon Black, are using Outreach to deliver higher revenue per sales rep. Now, without further ado, Let's go to the interview. Hey, everybody, it's Sam Jacobs, and you're listening to the Sales Hacker Podcast. Today, I am incredibly excited to have Amy Appleyard on the show. Uh, Amy Appleyard is the SVP of Global Inside Sales for Carbon Black, a leading cybersecurity company specializing in next-gen endpoint security solutions, and we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, they just went public, but prior to Carbon Black, Amy was VP of Sales for LogMeIn's communications and collaboration line of business. She's been doing sales for quite a while. Before moving into the tech sector, Amy led Staples Business Advantage's mid-market sales division, and she also had p- positions in finance, strategy, and marketing at Staples. And then before that, she co-founded an entertainment-based retail craft store. And um, I also think she ran a a theatrical lighting design firm based in New York. So we're really excited, Amy, to have you on the show. uh, And thanks for joining us. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm a, a big fan of the podcast, so I'm honored to be here. Well, that we we love our fans, so uh, it's great. To, it's great to chat. Five, with I'm you. a five star fan. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> okay, so we know your name. Uh, your title is officially SVP Global Inside Sales. I kind of read a little bit of the headline of Carbon Black, but it's always good to get sort of the overview from somebody that works there. So tell us, in your words, what Carbon Black does. Oh, absolutely. Um, So just a little background on the company. We are a cybersecurity company based in Waltham, so just outside of Boston. About a thousand people in total, a couple hundred inside sales reps, and we're hovering at around 200 million now with plans to keep on growing, which is part of the reason why I joined. And my teams help to provide endpoint security solutions for IT and security professionals. We actually um, serve customers of all sizes, so SMB, corporate, all the way up to Fortune. 100, but my inside teams focus primarily on the SMB and the corporate space. Wow. We really, yeah. So um, it's a bi- it's a big uh, big division. Um, we're pretty excited about it. Lots of growth opportunities. And um, at Carbon Black, we really do believe that the endpoints are what needs securing. So this is the the way modern day cyber attacks are happening. And the solutions that we provide really do make it easier for defenders to protect the endpoints, and then harder for the attackers to get in. So. It's a really exciting space right now. It's a big total addressable market. There's a, a lot of folks out there doing similar things along the lines of ours, but uh, we're pretty proud of what we've built and the customers we're serving, continuing to innovate and just having a blast doing so. That's fantastic. And so you joined just post IPO, is that right? That's correct. Yep. And how big is your team? 
So we have about 200 on the inside. So I have four directors, actually four female directors. Um, covering That's a good job. Eight, Thank you for doing yeah. that. <laughs> so it happened before I came. It was one of the, it was very impressive to me when I, <laughs> when I uh, heard about it coming in, learning about the teams. So it was definitely something that made my eyes kind of, you know, I got pretty excited. And uh, 18 managers. So Roughly half of our folks are SDRs who help not only the inside teams, but also our field sellers uh, line up appointments and kind of get the conversation started with our prospects. And then the, the rest are quota carriers. And so when you joined, was the team this big? Has it grown? I mean, I guess, when did you join? Just a couple months ago? I just joined a couple months ago, and they had just gone through um, big growth um, over the course of this year, this year, 2018. The company is really invested in the mid-market and continues to do so. So there's a lot of room for growth for us. And all of these teams were built when I got here, but we're still on a path to growth. So we are definitely hiring and always looking for the best talent that we can find. That's fantastic. So we're going to dive into kind of your origin story, as we might call it in a superhero movie. Mm -hmm. But I'm actually pretty interested just in, in what you just said. So you just inherited a very large team. When you were leaving LogMeIn and thinking about and, and coming to Carbon Black, how do you prepare for that? What sort of steps did you take to try and have, you know, the right level of influence around your your onboarding, your personal onboarding into the organization? And how do you build, you know, influence and advocacy within such a large team as somebody that's sort of inheriting all of these hiring decisions? What's what's your strategy? What's your philosophy? That's a really good question. It was definitely a lot of you know, just we could have seemed like big, nameless, faceless groups of people, right, to get to know. But I tend to take a pretty personal approach anyway. And for me, the goal was to do that as fast as possible. So I had spent time with the directors when I first came on board, and then also with the management team, just kind of telling them, explaining to them kind of who I was and what was important to me and what was important to me as a, as a leader, but also just in terms of getting to know the company and the customer. I tend to be somebody who really digs into the details. And it's not because I'm a micromanager. It's just because I want to really understand things. And then once I understand it, I'm out. I'm back up to the 3,000 or the 10,000 or the 100,000 foot view. So I asked them for help in getting to know their teams and understand you know, their pipeline and everything that was going on within the business as fast as possible. And then set up just a series of roundtable discussions where small groups, me with the manager and the team could be anywhere from 8, 10, 12 people and do a lot of going around the room, just making sure that I understood who everybody was and how long they'd been with the company. I had asked for the managers to each prepare a slide, like a Facebook slide, just a picture of them and um, a picture of an you know, individual, like the headshot type, you know, LinkedIn type picture of everyone on their yeah. team with their names and then just some basic contact information, how long they've been with the company. If they had moved internally, we do a lot of internal promotions here from, we do the SDR path all the way up to, you know, principal inside, inside sales rep. And then one little bit of information, like where they went to college or what their favorite movie was, because that little thing just helps me connect the names with the faces. And so I probably spent a good portion of my first month on the job just doing roundtable discussions and getting to know people. And then I would often, through the course of these conversations, ask, what's your favorite product to sell? Or what are you, you know, what's your favorite way to overcome objections? Um, and this would help me get connected to the product. So that was one strategy just for getting to connect the names to all of the faces. And then the other was to really understand the customers as quickly as I possibly could, because I think that's, of course, what we're all here for. So I tried to just fill my calendar, connected pretty quickly with the um, with our SE team, our solutions engineering team, and said, fill my calendar with as many demos, POCs, everything as possible as you can, you know, any space you can find, fill it, because then I would get the, you know, the benefit of not only meeting more of my sales reps and getting to know them on a personal level, but listening in on what the questions the customers were asking and getting to see demos of the products. So we do sell quite a few different things. We have a cloud-based offering and there's a bunch of different blades on it and I needed to understand all of those things. And that really helped me ramp up. If that, I think answers your question. Yeah, no, it does. It's, um, was, and did you feel, how, I guess, I guess this is probably something that you, you negotiate with the CEO or, you know, as you come into the organization, but, you know, you were able to sort of say, here's the, here are the milestones that I want to be held accountable to. And maybe it's like the first 90 days or 180 days, really, I'm just going to be in kind of market development research mode. And then from there, we can figure out what the right targets are. Is that sort of how you approached it? 
Yeah. I always hear about those no-fly zones, you know, where people can come in and they have 30 days or 60 days or 90 days to just watch and observe. And um, I'm not that kind of a person. <laughs> so I just, I would love to think that I could do that, but I just cannot sit still. So I, um, I had set um, expectations with our, our COO, who I report to directly, and our CEO, that I would, I would listen and learn and observe. And you know, th- within 30 to 60 days, I would just have some kind of a, a readout of what I was, was seeing and where I felt like there were opportunities for us to either um, you know, step on the gas or um, make some changes or tweaks to our sales process, et cetera. Um, and after uh, 30 days, I had a, a readout for our executive team and was able to say, like, here's what I'm seeing and here's where I think there's tremendous opportunity and and here's, you know, the number I think we're going to hit by the end of Q4 because, oh, by the way, we're in Q4 when I started. Wow. So, um, so that was fun to try to figure that out fast. And then I also have worked in, in strategy and am able to, I think, just assess situations pretty quickly and kind of make a roadmap of here's what we need to work on and, and what here's what needs to go first, second, third, that kind of thing. So I was also doing that in the back of my mind as I was getting to know people and understanding our, our numbers and what our growth strategies were and you know plans for 2019. So I was also kind of doing a little bit of that, like just my own internal consulting, like trying to figure out how to make the most of everything that we had and deliver more with everything that we have while that was happening. So I did that at 30 days, and then I've just been kind of marching to that uh, roadmap since then. And um, we are closing in on the end of the quarter and uh, super happy with the results. The teams are are fired up and um, has some gong ringing today. We had one young woman who just hit plan, and that's pretty exciting, right? So That is exciting. So uh, for the listeners out there, we're recording this on December 18th, which is uh, my Mm -hmm. brother's birthday. Happy birthday, Josh. and I guess there's, you know, officially, I mean, would you consider there to be like two, at this point, it's the end of the day, Tuesday. So three business days from your perspective left in the year, or you guys are pushing all the way to midnight on, we're, on New Year's? We're, go- we're going to the end. Yeah, we are going to the end. We'll be in a little bit after Christmas and then we'll definitely be in that Monday. Um, we're all going to, I actually am going to try to challenge people to just come in in their pajamas <laughs> or something <laughs> just to make it fun. Because usually I, I lay around on the 31st uh, in my pajamas all day and watch movies with my with my three girls and my husband. So I won't be able to do that this week because of where, you know, the 31st falls, but it's worth it. I'll be with my with my new family here. Yeah. Uh, in, I mean, our you'll, be ha- yeah. you'll be having fun. Uh, <laughs> yeah. And you guys are you guys are going to hit the number. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we, we, we will hit it. We are on, that is a, fantastic. on a path. Yep. <laughs> so. um well, there's so much I want to I want to ask you about, but let's let's uh, rewind a little bit and go back to the days of theater, which which I mentioned in your bio. Uh, the listeners should also know that you know I went to the University of Virginia. Sadly, Amy, you graduated from Virginia Tech, so <laughs> we're not gonna we're not gonna hold that against you. Well, but how, versus Hokies, yeah, that's it. And you know, it wasn't it hasn't been a rivalry in football at least for long enough that I have a leg to stand on. But um, you came out and you were a theater major. Walk us through. You know, uh, you you obviously don't have to give us every single last detail, but it is pretty interesting how you've evolved from a theater major to running, you know, a sales team of two hundred people. Where you you know even even just in the last couple of minutes, you were you were re, you were emphasizing how good you are in terms of like your ability to forecast and hit the number, but also rally the troops. So how did that how did that happen, and how does theater inform what you're doing now? Walk us through a little bit of uh, of the journey. Yeah, I will absolutely. It's I sound like a crazy person, I know, when as you just described me, but it actually all does make <laughs> sense, or at least to me it does when I kind of thread the just kind of fill in the gap. So I was a theater major, but um, I also st- studied math and accounting and just loved all of that. I was, I've always been pretty analytical. Within working in theater, what I was drawn to was lighting and theatrical lighting design. And there's a, a, a lot of organizational components to that. There's also a lot of ways, you, it's almost like applied math in terms of figuring out how you use lighting, what light you use in, in different situations and at what distance and stuff like that. So it was there was a, a definitely a, a technical side of it that was really appealing to me. And it was also just a lot of fun. And I tend to be somebody who kind of runs toward risky situations. So naturally, upon graduation, I just moved to New York. I had never been to New York before. Well, once as a Girl Scout. I grew up in North Carolina. So once as a Girl Scout when I was like 13. But there I was with a couple of suitcases and $1,000 in my pocket and trying to figure out like how to make a go of it. But I had a network of friends. We had a, bunch, a handful of us had moved up. And we found an apartment and just kind of started carving out careers. And for me, what worked was I had done a series of summer interviews 
internships during my time at Virginia Tech. And so I had um, professional connections as well in New York. And I had a couple of gigs lined up and one thing kind of led to another. And um, I ended up just really forming a, a nice career, a very busy one, but lots of travel, crazy lifestyle, loved what I was doing and thought that I could do that for quite some time. But then I actually met my husband and, and we got, I met the man who would be my husband. We got married, wanted to have children. And i had had a very suburban upbringing and we felt like maybe we needed to get out of the city for a while to figure out what we wanted to do, you know, personally and professionally. And I thought, why not just have a baby and then go to business school? So that's what I did. So I started business school with a, a three-month-old and um, took a couple years to study finance as well as nonprofit management. Had the intention of going back into theater, but on the producing side. But I realized, I think just through other folks that I had met in business school, that there were just there were parts of my brain that I what, hadn't been working for a while and uh, was ready to get that going again. Loved studying corporate finance and really liked kind of energizing all the analytical side of my brain. So ended up launching a, a small retail venture right after business school, which is how I fell in love with kind of the retail industry, which then led me to Staples, which seems a little strange because I'd always done, you know, small entrepreneurial ventures. But another big life thing happened. I actually had um, twins. So I had had one child while oh, wow. in, in um, business school and then, and then had twins and knew that I needed to stop kind of burning the candle at both ends and thought I should get probably a regular job. So threw my hat in the ring for a, a position in finance at Staples and within a few weeks found myself sitting in a cube for the first time in my life. And um, Staples oh, amazingly was incredibly entrepreneurial for a company that was so big. And there were real opportunities for people who, if you wanted to define your own career, you could. I was in strongly encouraged to look at other things other than just like your classic finance job. I had a great manager who sort of pointed me in a few different directions. And as soon as I found the sales organization, the B2B division within Staples, I knew this is where I belong. And so I started running a strategy group and would put together teams of people to find different initiatives that we thought could deliver additional revenue for the business. So there were a lot of, you know, clearly financial calculations that you had to do in order to get, you know, convince somebody that you could spend some money to make more money and would just pull together different folks from the sales organization to try new things. And in that role, I was able to get really close to a lot of frontline sales managers. So people who were working on, on inside sales teams, people who were working on field sales teams, our B2B, our hunting team who were out there pounding the pavement, you know, trying to bring on net new customers. And I really loved what the frontline sales managers were doing. And I felt a deep connection to them. And after running enough kind of successful initiatives, I was actually placed in role leading all of our inside sales teams, our mid-market sales division. And w at that point, it was just my, I don't know if you've read the book Owen Meany by John Irving, but that was like the Owen Meany moment. It was like where everything just came together. And I realized like, this is my calling. I love working in sales, in particular inside, love the mid-market. You know, I l really like small customers and I really like I just kind of live vicariously through our customers. So was appreciating that <laughs> and also really liked the social component of sales combined with all the kind of prep work that you have to do behind the scenes. And it felt almost like working in theater, right? There's a lot of, there's the, when you're in front of the customer, when you're backstage and that felt very comfortable to me. And also most folks in sales have an extremely high tolerance for risk, which was just as appealing to me as the folks in theater that I had been drawn to in my first career. So it felt like, it just felt very similar. I think a lot of people tie their personal and their professional lives together in sales and you do the same in theater. So it just felt at home. And Staples really gave me great runway and let me do a tremendous amount. I was kind of learning from folks in the Boston tech community, other um, colleagues that I had gotten to know and trying to apply a lot of what the tech sales people I knew were doing within their organizations to our inside sales division at Staples, which was not quite as high tech, but we were able to introduce a lot of a lot of tools and technologies and different sales processes. I actually started writing business over the phone, which was unheard of, like, you know, fired up a kind of demand gen engine coming from the marketing team, had great partners there who were willing to rethink how we serve the mid-market. And appreciated that and loved all the teams who kind of came with me along that journey because it was a change for sure. And then through that, I ended up meeting some folks from um, LogBeIn and was asked to come over and, and lead inside teams there. So that's when I jumped from distribution into, into SaaS sales. 
and then recently moved to Carbon Black. So it's been no looking back since I hit sales for sure. And um, I'm really comfortable and, and happy working in the tech sector now because it really brings together my love of technology as well. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing story. I guess, were you surprised that yeah. you liked sales or that you even ended up in sales? I have to imagine, you know, a theater sort of dr- drama background, maybe, maybe like a little left leaning, maybe not, not thinking of yourself as too mercenary and then in finance and being highly analytical. And then, and then all of a sudden you're in sales and, and sort of, as you mentioned, realizing that that was your calling, how, what was that kind of realization like? And I guess for a lot of people out there, it's very difficult to major in sales. So lots and lots of people aren't sure whether this is a career for them. What is your advice to people? How how do you know it's a career for you? What are the elements that really resonate? Yeah, that's a good, that's a, I like how you asked that question because people have asked me similar things, but never in quite that way. But I, I think in terms of resonating and how did I know this is what made sense to me? I actually have a, um, I have a 16 year old daughter now and she's thinking about college. You know, how do you know what you'd want to do for the rest of your life? And I don't think you ever know what you want to do. But when I started working in sales, I just, I felt like myself, like, I just felt like, Oh, this, I know what I'm doing. Like this actually, I'm much more confident. I'm, I really enjoy this. This makes a lot of sense to me. So there was just a natural feeling there. It was never anything that I could have planned. And I think now you occasionally hear about there are, are some schools where you can major in sales or you would learn a lot about sales. I know Mark, Mark Roberge is doing some great work teaching at, at Harvard at HBS people how to, you know, how you would actually stand up a sales organization and all that you would need to do. But I never thought of it as a profession. I, it just sort of, I fell into it because it made me happy. And I think you get that positive reinforcement when you feel like you're, you're good at something and you're happy. But I couldn't have planned for it. With that said, I do talk to a lot of younger folks who are thinking about it, people who might be in marketing and they think maybe they should try sales. And I always say you should absolutely try if you think you have any interest in it, because you will learn so much about the business and about the customer. And it just gives you these incredible building blocks for anything that you might want to do, especially for somebody in marketing who might be interested. Because if you can actually say that you've sold, you have so much more credibility with any sales organization you ever might want to serve if you head back into the marketing role. So I think I think that answered your question, but for, it wasn't a plan. It just happened, and it had, I'm really happy that it did. Yeah. Um, were you self conscious that? Because I, I, if I understand correctly, you kind of went from a an operation slash finance position to running a team. Yeah. Have you ever sort of carried a bag on your own or carried a phone? I guess we're using the metaphor. <laughs> carried a headset. Head 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 um, <laughs> yeah. no, well, so the I've always had the hustle, right? So when I was a theatrical lighting designer, it was basically it was an LLC, right? So I sold my, myself, my skills. I had to fit in 10, 12 shows a year in order to make a decent living, right? So I lived in New York and there was a lot of networking. There was a lot of figuring out how to kind of self-promote. So in that way, you're selling something that's pretty intangible, right? Because you can take pictures of a show, show you might have lit or hopefully get somebody to a show that maybe you were involved with to see your work. But that was definitely a sales role. And then when I had launched the retail venture, the colleague that I launched it with, we had actually written the business plan for kind of a capstone course in, in business school and were approached after we had given a you know, for a panel of judges, we had done the final presentation. We were approached by a couple of folks and asked if we were looking for funding and if we had a term sheet. So we weren't even planning necessarily to go into business until we were approached in that way. And within three, four months, we, we had, we were C-Corp and we were raising money and we got the thing up and running. And then we realized about a year after we had put pen to paper to start the business plan that we were kind of open for business and we had to figure out how to sell stuff, right? So, so then it was like, wow, we got, we have employees and we have to come up with a sales methodology and a process and a plan. And um, that was probably the, the closest thing to carrying a bag that I've had. And then at Staples, the teams that I was working with, I would go out on sales calls. I would spend a lot of time on the phone with people trying to see how customers would react. But I wasn't quoted carrying in those roles initially, not until I moved into sales leadership. So it is definitely a non-traditional path, yeah. but one that I think has served me well or and perhaps in a unique way because I think I can have a perspective on the business that is the 10,000 foot view or the 30,000 or 100,000 foot view. You know, I can look at kind of big strategic things that we might need to do and not be immediately connected to how challenging they can be. 
which I think is sometimes one of the hardest steps when you come up from having been a, a quota carrying rep to a manager to a director. Every step up that you get in that level of leadership, you're having to make more and more difficult decisions and separating yourself from the impact, the direct impact to a rep maybe is easier for me because I didn't sit in that seat with the headset on and try to work my way toward a, a big giant quota, you know, from day one of a new fiscal year. You just said something incredibly interesting. So your point, and this is, I don't know if it was Patton, it was some general talking about how, you know, too much empathy can be almost be a bad thing in the sense that you have to be able to yeah. make tough decisions. Are you talking about, you know, for example, decisions to raise quota or decisions to commit to a number around a new product before you have enough market feedback? Are those some of the decisions where if you've come up directly from the ranks, maybe you're too, absolutely. You're too sensitive? Yeah, absolutely. I think that I think that is the hardest thing for folks, especially moving from a manager to a director role, is when you kind of turn that hat from like really empathizing with the rep to being that it is company first, right? That that is a very difficult thing for many people to to get over, and it doesn't mean I probably then over empathize in other situations with the reps because I do understand how challenging it is. We're going through territory planning now. We're building out, you know, assigning quota for next year, and you know, I really want everything to be like from a parity perspective perspective from rep to rep, from manager to manager, I'm like ticking and tying everything because I'm over empathizing with somebody who might then feel like, ooh, this, uh, my patch isn't as equal to the person who's sitting next to me's patch. And so I probably over index on a few things, but th you can figure that out with the numbers, right? So I'm really comfortable there. But yeah, I do think that it's a great thing to, for many people to learn. And I think that I can provide perspective and have certainly helped coach people into thinking slightly differently. And, you know, tipping the scale more toward company first as opposed to individual first. Wow. That's, um, that's very difficult to do. What's, what's the advice that you give or is there a, or is it just, Hey, you know, you have to stop thinking that way. Like wh how, how do you, how do you do that for an up and coming manager? Yeah. I mean, I think for, first you got to understand what they want and what they're career growth is, right? Maybe a manager is really happy just being a manager, but if they want to go further, being able to demonstrate that you can separate yourself from the immediacy of some of the decisions is, is important. And people that I have coached usually are coming to me for advice. You know, how did you do it? Or how do I get ahead? How do I think about this differently? I think it, it is a message that I try to send out to folks. And if people are receptive to it, there are ways to coach around it, right? Knowing that it will be a blocker. Like it just will. If you can't make a decision that is in the best interest of the company and there, you know, you always have do segmentation challenges. This should be mine. This shouldn't be, you know, and then you got to think about well, where's that's a great opportunity, right? If somebody feels like this is in my patch, but I actually know oh, no, that really belongs to the field, right? That is not one of ours. Having somebody understand and be able to tell you why it makes sense to move that one to the field because it's going to be better served by the customer or maybe that customer does need a regular check-in or we think there's a bigger opportunity there that would be better for the company if it sits with the field. That's a tough one, but that, that those come up a lot, right? So that's a great opportunity to talk to somebody about what they want to do kind of longer term professionally. Hey, let's think about this for the whole of the business. And maybe it softens the pain of you know having lost a large account or a large opportunity. That's a, a great teachable moment, even as painful as it can be. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I remember, uh, in one of, one of the companies where I worked, uh, one of the managers, the mid-market manager, we had a rule that if it was enterprise, the enterprise controlled all of the subsidiary companies of that large conglomerate. Yeah. And the mid-market manager came and said, we've got, we're all the way down the sales cycle with this one company. And we just did a little Hoover's research and realized our subsidiary, what should we do? And I said, well, we've already decided what yeah. the rules are. Yeah. You, you have to give it to the enterprise team. Yeah. But then you can make fun of them for chasing $2,000 deals, right? $5,000 deals. That's what I do. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Exactly. I actually might. Public have, shaming. I might have done that a few times. <laughs> what um, You mentioned that you really like mid-market and SMB and you really like inside sales. And of course, to your point, you've been that customer. You've run SMB businesses on your own and understand the challenges. But when you think about kind of even tactics and methodologies, what are some of the core, you know, competitive advantages that you think you bring to the table when you're running a, an inside sales team that you think really are helpful and help make that team run, run on time? 
Yeah, so I'm. Uh, I think, like most inside sales leaders, I don't know if this is anything unique to me, but I think I'm really process oriented and process driven, and I believe that activity begets sales, right? Like there's a core set of things that we should all be doing on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and that that will set us up for success to to meet our bookings target, right? So, but you got to do these small things along the way to get there. So I do spend quite a bit of time talking about the sales process, ensuring that we have the right one and that we as a, as a management and leadership team actually can spell out, you know, what are the five things that everybody, that's our job. Like we have to figure out, you know, how many phone calls, how much pipeline, how, what are the things that you need to do to be successful? And we have to figure that out. So that's kind of the handshake with my teams is that I'm going to work really hard to make sure that we've got the formula right, but you have to commit to the formula. And we might tweak it along the way, but we believe that this is what will lead us to success. So I think that's where the um, like analytical side of me comes in. But then you can also really personalize it because if people commit to the activities that we believe will deliver success, then we will be successful. It also then lets you kind of back your way into, well, gosh, if you're doing four of the five things, is there some reason why you're not doing the fifth, right? Like, are you making a ton of dials, getting great conversations, building a lot of pipeline, but you just aren't booking everything, right? There's some, then you probably don't know how to close. Like maybe we need just to get you some special coaching on closing or negotiating, or maybe you're discounting too much. Like there's, it helps us identify like what needs to be worked on to help everybody get to being, you know, attain to attaining. So I would say that's probably the core thing going for me. I also just, I really like, I love an inside sales floor. I love the energy and the vibe and walking around in the morning and just talking to people or just picking up on, you know, when the, throughout the course of the day, things kind of peak in the ebb and the flow. I I'm a big fan of like group exercise, right? So I'll go do a spin class or yoga class or something where there's a lot of people with individual goals all in the same room trying to achieve the same thing in a given time frame. And I think an inside sales floor can be a lot of that as well. So I love to kind of set the the tone for what we accomplish and have everybody have a, a personal goal, but also all of us have a collective goal together. I think those are, I don't know that those are unique, but I think those are, a few of the ways that I kind of think about running an inside team. I know you're like, you're the big deal guy. I love the mid market. I love that predictable engine (laughs) that we can provide to the rest of an organization. Just high velocity. We know it's coming. If we fire up the demand gen and get all the leads flowing, we absolutely can deliver X because we've defined the process. That to me is powerful. I mean, my, my world is, is uh, scary and how binary it is, you and know, l- lumpy, yeah. you're, the, you're like the lumpy, those big deals. And then the, you got to have a, if we're going to, if this, if this org is going to grow or anything is going to grow, you really need some kind of predictable revenue engine. And I think the mid market with most products there, there's an, an opportunity for that. Do yeah. you have, um, do you guys use Bant or do you have a, I guess I have sort of two. One, a tactical question, like what's your qualification methodology? And then the second is, do you believe that it matters? Do you, know, do you bring a specific kind of sales process or you know, a, diff- a specific way you want to architect the sales cycle in terms of entry and exit criteria for Salesforce stages that you think makes a difference? What's your point of view on sort of qualification and sales methodology and how do you approach that? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I love the question. And it's something that I've been spending a lot of time talking with people here about. I'm most familiar with Banth. That's what we were using at at Logman. Um, It was really built into the sales process and and appreciated that. Here, there's been a history of using MedPick, but there's also some Banth questions worked in. There's a a few different things stylistically that are happening. We have uh, a company that has grown through, there was an acquisition, there's kind of a smushing together of sales methodologies. And I think think one thing that we'll do for next year is really get it to be all the same. So much more similar and very tied to specifically what we're selling and what we need kind of at each point in the sales process. So I don't think MedPick will go away. I think that's been here for a while and I expect that we'll, we'll stick with that. You know, we have a, it's a very we have a very technical buyer and we do need to make sure that we're going slow and kind of checking all of those boxes through the process. So that's probably what we'll stick with. Yeah. Uh, and and for me, I do think you need something. I think you need something if for no other reason than just to provide something to coach from, right? Because if, if everybody's all over the place, it's harder to say like, hey, you know what? The, you know, nine times out of 10, this is going to help you if you just follow this path. And people tend to, to like a path. <laughs> they sure do. But it sounds like your point, which I, I think I probably fundamentally agree with is it's, you need, you need something, 
but you know, there's not going to be a massive difference if it's med pick or medic or medical or bant or whatever. It's just, you need some kind of framework that's consistent. Yeah. Yes. Yes. hundred percent. So one of the, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a pretty big, I don't know if it's an elephant in the room, but it's, but it's a fact of life, which is that you have three kids and mm-hmm. you know, you, you've chosen a really difficult path and you're, you know, you're kicking ass at it, but what's your advice? I mean, I think specifically it's harder candidly for women than for men, even with, you know, our, our striving for gender equality, a lot of the household duties and domestic duties may be based on, you know, centuries of stereotypes, but they still tend to fall disproportionately on, uh, on women. Mm-hmm. How have you thought about your career? How do you think about giving advice to, because we want you know, we need and want more women in executive positions, in executive sales positions. What's the advice that you give to the up and comers and, and how do you lay that foundation for the future and how did you approach it? Yeah, um, I do like this question and I, I have, um, I tend to speak pretty openly and freely and personally when asked questions like this, because I do have a lot of young women asking me. So I'm glad that you asked it. And there's a couple different things that happened for me. One is I married the right guy, right? So I, my husband is amazing and, um, we, it's a partnership and we hit a point in our, um, kind of crazy lives where we made a decision that I really loved my job and I loved working and that we would sort of organize around that, right? So his career took a little bit of a back seat or maybe a side seat. I think maybe it's in the passenger seat, but it's, um, it's still important to him, but it's not as important as mine is to me, just in terms of my, like defining who I am and, and what makes me really happy. So he actually, after the twins, when the twins were, gosh, probably three, four years old, he made the decision to work freelance from home. So my husband's a writer, he's a technical writer and works in the healthcare industry and had worked at enough different places that he could kind of contact folks and build up a little bit of his own clientele. And and we were comfortable with him, you know, making the leap when we needed it. And um, that then turned in, that was like one of the best decisions we ever made. So I think he probably would like to get back into an office environment and not be alone, you know, for many hours of the day, writing and talking via conference call and and, uh, you know, go to meeting, but he is doing well and he spends a ton of time with our girls. So he knows how to put, you know, the hair in buns for ballet. (laughs) He can do, he (laughs) drives carpools. He's on a more of a texting basis with all the moms in my neighborhood than I am arranging play days after school. Uh, There was a period of time where kids would often just pile into our house in the morning and he would drive everyone up to school because there were quite a few moms who work in our neighborhood and they knew that my husband would be home. (laughs) And um, there were, I knew there were more kids than there were seatbelts in the cars when he would car, when he was driving everybody up to school, but I just let that pass. Um, because I was on my way to work. Um, So (laughs) I think we had a good kind of balance there. I'll also say that there comes a point where you just got to decide, like, am I going to, I don't cook. Like, I, you know, I would rather on the nights where I offer to do dinner, I order out or I order in for us or I take people out or we do something different. I'm happy to have to pay for somebody to clean my house. I'm happy to do, like, there are things that I just don't put a burden on myself. And I think that that is, was it just a choice or a decision that you make when I have free time, I want to spend it with my family. And there's plenty of people who are willing to help, especially if you can, you know, pay them to do the, the cleaning or the yard work or the things that just aren't a priority for me right now. Does that make sense? Do you, do you believe, of course it yeah. does. And, you know, as my wife will tell you, I am a, I am a services guy. I want to pay somebody to do basically everything. <laughs> but I, I was trying to get some pay to somebody to clean my closet, and she said that's just ridiculous. <laughs> so so I, uh, I have to do that myself still. Um, but that's you – know, yeah, of course it makes sense. Do you believe that people can have it all? You know, Sheryl Sandberg says lean in. Oh, no. She also happens to be a billionaire. Yeah. I, you know, so, is that possible? I think you just got to define what your all is. And I think it ebbs and flows, right? This is what we're doing for now. And like everything is working, but it might not always be this way. I think one of the things I really love about working in sales is that the personal and professional lives can so blend together. I think also working in sales, you have a lot of flexibility with your schedule, right? So if you need to get to a doctor's appointment with your daughter, or if you need to go and see a ballet recital, there are ways to work around it. You still got to hit your number, but you can hit your number in a different way. Like it doesn't have to be in the traditional nine to five glued to a desk. 
And so I think that has provided a lot of opportunity for me. But I, my, when I, you know, I got my lists that I work, I'm a big list maker. When I work through my list or when I organize my calendar, half of it is work stuff, half of it is personal. It's all blended together. That's just, I don't think of it as a balance. I just think of it as this is my life. Yep. And it's all the, the new important. phrase is work life integration exactly. as opposed to work life balance. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, um, while we're on this, the topic of sort of like, you know, life optimization, you know, there's this Twitter meme or, and people make fun of it, of course, but you know, all of the best people wake up at 4 a.m. Mm-hmm. You know, there's this theme or this idea held among some people that you, you have to grind that, you know, success is a grind and it is a, a grind of 20 hour days or 18 hour days. And you don't believe that what's your approach and, and give us sort of your reaction to that sentiment that, you know, if you're not, if you're not burning the candle at both ends, that you're not, you're not strong enough to, to make your career work. Yeah, I think, so I definitely was in the work like crazy mode for a while in my life and realized, you know, you get tired. Like you can't, you're not making good decisions. You're getting frustrated. You're, if every time you see an old friend, you say, oh my gosh, everything's so crazy. Like that's, nobody wants to hear that anymore, let alone like me. Like I was tired of saying it. So I then just realized like I I probably could get more done if I didn't try to in the midnight, you know, just, I, I just put some structure around my life. Like there's things that I do. I don't get up at four. I do get up at five though, but that's because <laughs> I really enjoy working out in the morning and having just time to myself. I love having a cup of coffee, reading the paper. Um, and what time, just, what time do you go to bed? It depends on if I'm trying to catch up on work or emails, but anywhere in the nine thirty ten 10 to eleven thirty twelve. 12, range. Mm. Um, I, I, five, six hours of sleep, I'm good, but seven, eight hours of sleep, I'm great. So if I can get <laughs> that sleep, like I know I'm just going to really kick butt the next day, right. And accomplish a lot. And I try to leave every day by a, a reasonable time to get home in time for dinner. And I try not to get back online. It's a little different at a quarter as my family will tell you, but I try not to get back online until into the evening if I need to do emails. But there are also portions during the day at work where I make sure that I am spending time with people, getting, especially I'm in a new job now, getting to know people. But I always try to have either lunch or coffee or something where you're just like relaxed and you're not staring at your laptop or multitasking. And just I'm happier that way. And I think I make better decisions and I'm, you're better at listening when you're not doing a million things. I will say, I mean, there are points of time during the fiscal year, certainly, where you got to pull not all nighters, but you have to work really, really hard. But that's not a way that I can, that I am good at like maximizing my output. I'm better when there's a balance. And I, there are things that I have, I just, I need to do at least five times a week, like working out and just having some time to myself. And and so I make sure that happens. Some time with friends, time with family, those are all important things. And I think they make me better and stronger at work. I'm sure you're correct. I am, a, but this may be me rationalizing my own laziness, which happens a lot. <laughs> what, so we're coming to uh, to the end of this conversation. This has been amazing, and what we like to do is pay it forward. We like to figure out what's influencing you, what people have influenced you. So when you think about VPs of sales or chief marketing officers or chief revenue officers that you know either have have you admire or that we just you think we should know about uh give us some names so we can do a little googling and linkedin searching and and read yeah. up on some folks absolutely well so a couple of just my strongest mentors from staples um they have both recently left but neil ringel who was headed up all of the um, north american commercial division and then shira goodman who when i knew her most she was the ceo and provided great coaching and mentoring for me but then, of course, Larry D'Angelo at Logman is just a phenomenal CSO and has just a legacy of growing, grooming talent. So he's just incredible in the on the in the Boston tech community. And then a couple of folks that I really admire. Um, one is a guy named Josh Allen who was at Logman just prior to my joining. He left to go um, to Car Gurus, got them through their IPO, and now he's head of sales at Drift. So he's just a wonderful person and um, just has had a great career, like something that you know everybody kind of points to in admiration, and just has a, a good, very disciplined way of leading sales teams that everyone remembers and and, is, and recognizes. 
There's also a guy named Bob Marsh, who I really admire, who founded a company called Level 11 that made a, it's a sales enablement tool that that I used at mm-hmm. Staples. We're thinking about using one of the pieces of it here to help us build out a, a scorecard. I like him because he was a sales guy who who had and a sales manager and he had something he needed and he had, he went and made it, right? Because he didn't, he couldn't find what he needed in the marketplace. So I thought that was pretty cool. And that then, is pretty cool. Yeah. And there's a couple of personal mentors, some women that I've gotten to know in the Boston area who have really been helpful to to me uh, personally and professionally, but a woman named Liz Kane, who's with Open View Venture Partners, Kara Gilbert, Natasha's a cat. There's, um, there's a great group of uh, women in the Boston tech community who all bond together and, and make sure we have, you know, drinks at least once a quarter. But those three are certainly part of my, part of my close network. Awesome. Any books you think we should be uh, reading books that you think have informed your sales philosophy? Yeah, I'm a, I'm a, um, I love to read and just kind of consume anything, books, podcasts. I have just a stack of sales books, you know, by beside the bed um, that I'm trying to make my way through. There's a few that I always come back to, and a couple of them I'm in, you know, kind of rereading now and sharing with the, my leadership teams here at Carbon Black. One is called Cracking the Sales Management Code. It's an incredible book, Jason Jordan, Michelle Vizana, but it really puts out there this kind of a lot of It places a lot of importance on managing to the metrics, like making sure that you actually are managing not to some elusive bookings number, but to actual, you know, activities that can be managed, which is something that I really also believe in. And they uh, write some in there about just the importance of the frontline sales manager as being just the greatest point of leverage within any inside sales organization. And I 100% believe that. There's a book I often suggest to folks that are on my leadership team to read, which is called It's Your Ship by Captain Michael Abershoff. And it really just has great management philosophy perspective. Love that book. And uh, and I've come back to measure what matters. The John Doerr, just trying to figure out how to set OKRs in a new job, mm-hmm. in a new place. Like, it's hard, right? It's hard. And uh so that I have that one on audio. T- I listen to that on Audible. Awesome. Uh, and then last, uh, you know, any uh, mottos or principles, any phrase you want to leave us with as we head off into the sunset? I love and wear a mantra band, um, be here now. Just like be present. Just be in the moment. Enjoy every minute of your career, of your time, you know, of your day. I think don't don't rush because life is just, just kind of going to happen. And um, I think you can... Just be present is the best way to make uh, the next wonderful thing happen. I love it. Uh, Amy, thank you so much for joining us on the Sales Hacker Podcast. It's been a great conversation and uh, hope to talk to you or meet you soon. Thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. It is Sam Jacobs. This is Sam's Corner. And um, really, really enjoyed that conversation with Amy Appigard. She has just the right combination of skills required to be a really effective sales leader. She's got the right level of empathy. She's got the right analytical approach. And she also, uh, she just has a passion for sales itself. So I think that there was a lot to learn, particularly, listen, two points. And one of them, you know, is not really sales related per se, but it's just about how to get along in life. We talked about how she's managing a family of three And while she went to business school and while she runs a team of over 200 people, and what she said was she had an honest conversation with her partner, with her husband, and they divided up the responsibilities. And her husband is the guy that stayed at home and helped raise the kids and tackled the the majority of the domestic responsibilities. And Amy was the one that decided she wanted to pursue the career and make her career the priority from an economic perspective for that family. I think what it tells you, just if you're in a relationship out there, honest communication is always so important. It's important. important with the prospect. It's important with your partner, just establishing the right framework for how you both are going to make decisions, whatever type of partner uh, you choose. So sort of a random non-sales, but kind of sales, uh, all about the importance of authenticity and honesty when it comes and effective communication. Here's the second thing that she said, which is directly related to sales management. Man, wasn't it interesting when she said, you know, sometimes the problem that up and coming managers have is that they empathize too much with the individual rep, whether it's with territory design or with a dispute about you know which lead belongs to which person. But you have to be able to distance yourself from the team. And I see this time and time again, first time managers, you know, when they say my team, they mean the people that report to them. They mean, they mean the people that they control. 
And that's not the way to think about it. The first team has to be the company. And you, you know, you read about that in the, in Lencioni's book, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team, but really your first responsibility as you go higher in the organization is to the company itself. And the more you think that you are simply an advocate on behalf of the people that you manage, frankly, the less reliable you are to senior management because you are constantly advocating. You always want to bring home the raise and the better comp plan. You can't always do that. Sometimes you need to be the one explaining the decision that the company made back to the individual reps and building consensus from the top down to the people that you work with. Really, really important. Reach out to me if you have any questions about that because I've seen so many people fall into traps. Now, you'll find this podcast on iTunes or Google Play. We know you're kind of a big deal. So if you enjoyed this episode, you, whoever you are, if you're on your if you're in the car right now, pull over. Just pull over, get out your phone and share this episode on LinkedIn. Share it on Twitter or elsewhere. If you've got a great idea for a guest or for a piece of content, get in touch. So if you want to get in touch with me, find me on Twitter at Sam F. Jacobs or on LinkedIn at LinkedIn.com slash in slash Sam F. Jacobs, and we'd love to hear from you. Once again, a big shout out to our sponsors for this episode, which is chorus.ai and Outreach, the leading sales engagement platform. We will see you next time.